Amen. Amen. The part of Ephesians chapter 5 that I'd like to focus on is beginning there in verse number 11 where the Bible reads, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And the title of my sermon this morning is Freemasonry in light of the Bible. Freemasonry in light of the Bible. What we see from this scripture is that we should have nothing to do with, we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we should rep reprove them. Now reprove them means to tell them that they're wrong, to speak out against them, and to let people know about the evil. It says it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, And I want to focus on that word secret. Anytime you have a secret society or a secretive organization, that is a sign of wickedness. When you look at the local church here as an institution or any Bible-believing Baptist church, transparency is there. You don't have to get inducted into higher levels to learn the doctrine of the church. The church openly proclaims its doctrine. All of our teachings are exposed to the world. There's no secret that you learn after one year or five years or ten years. It's all just out there. It's all out. All the sermons are out there. All of the teachings are out there. The whole Bible is available. This is our only scripture. We don't get out some other secretive scripture later. Secret societies are by nature wicked. Because the Bible says all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. You see, things that are wicked are done under the cover of darkness. Yeah. The Bible says this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so darkness has to do with obscuring things, hiding things, being secretive about beliefs and rituals and practices, whereas God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Yeah. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But the Bible says in verse 13, all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Now, the light is the word of God. The light is the gospel. And when we reprove the unfruitful works of darkness, we use the word of God to do it. We shine the light on the darkness and expose the works of darkness. Let me give you one more scripture before I get into this. You don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 10, 21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Now, I'm going to prove to you this morning that Freemasonry is of the devil. Right. It's the worship of the devil. It's an idolatrous temple and cult to the devil. And the Bible says you can't do both. You can't worship the Lord and worship the devil. And so they'll try to tell you that you can be both a Christian and a Freemason, but it isn't true. Now you say, well, why would you preach on this, Pastor Anderson? Is this a big issue? Are there a lot of Masons out there? Well, did you know that there are over 2 million Masons in North America, which is mostly the United States? So there are almost 2 million Freemasons in the United States. Keep in mind... This is an organization that's only for men. So that's not even counting all the female counterparts of masonry or their wives and, and children that are involved in this. For example, the daughters of Job and the Shriners and the witches of the East Orient, or I don't know, that's not what it's called, but it's called something like that, right? But anyway, you know, there are over 2 million masons in North America and there are nearly 5 million worldwide. Did you know that 14 presidents of the United States have been high-level Freemasons. And by the way, don't accuse me of going to some conspiracy website. All of this is coming off of their own websites. I went to their websites, and you know they have different grand lodges and different chapters and different areas. But I went, one website that I got a lot of this from is 32nddegreemasons.org, which is the chapter that's out of Dearborn, Michigan. But, but I looked at California lodges, different lodges all over the United States, they all pretty much believe a lot of the same things. There are little differences, but the stuff I'm going to be preaching on this morning applies to all of them. And this is not coming from some wild-eyed conspiracy theory website. This is coming from their own website, so nobody can argue with this information. 
This is their own website saying that there are 14 U.S. presidents that were Freemasons. George Washington, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, James Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, William Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, and Gerald Ford. All Freemasons. Masons have always had great influence on the U.S. Supreme Court. From the inception of the Supreme Court in 1789 through 1940, there were never less than three Masonic justices during a term, except on two occasions, beginning with Mason President Franklin Roosevelt through the first three years of, of Richard Nixon's term. Masons dominated the court in a ratio of five to four, beginning in 1941, to seven to two in 1946. So basically there's always been at least three Freemasons on the Supreme Court. Usually it, it was something like four or five or even seven of them that are on the record as being, and they're, they're, this is the Freemasons bragging about, hey, we have all these prestigious members, presidents, Supreme Court justices, etc. Paul Wittenberger was at an independent fundamental Baptist church in Southern California and one of the deacons showed up to church wearing a belt buckle of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And Brother Wittenberger approached him, his wife was there, and said, what's going on with that belt buckle? And he said, oh, I'm a Freemason. He was a deacon in, a, in an independent fundamental Baptist church, King James. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, let's start out by just looking at the 33 degrees of Freemasonry. Okay, so in Freemasonry, their little club for grown-up little boys. <laughs> they give themselves all these titles and they reach these different degrees or different levels of Freemasonry. There are 33 in total. I'm going to give you the names of these degrees and then I'm going to explain the details of some of them. And again, this is from 32ndDegreeMasons.org, which is a, a, a Lodge's website advertising this. Now, I can't really go super deep into Freemasonry from their own websites because it's a secret organization. But this is just, they give you a little taste of it. You know, they give you a little bit. And even just from the little bit that they tell you, you can tell that it's of the devil. Okay. Listen to this. So degree number one, entered apprentice. Degree number two, fellow craft. Degree number three, master mason. Degree number four, master traveler. Degree number five, perfect master. Degree number six, master of the brazen serpent. Now, that's pretty weird because here's the thing. The bra if you're going to look at the brazen serpent, depending on what kind of imagery you use, you could say, okay, well, the serpent in the Bible represents the devil. Okay, I don't, who's going to call themselves the master of the devil? That's weird, right? But then if you say, well, when the brazen serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, it was a picture of Jesus being lifted up on the cross because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that brazen serpent lifted up represented Christ becoming sin because the brazen serpent represented sin. But here's the thing. Nobody better call themselves the master of Jesus either. Yeah, right. Either way, it's a weird name. Yeah. So anybody who's a sixth degree Mason or higher has been known as uh, the master of the brazen serpent. If they're in this Detroit lodge, give me a break. Seventh degree, provost and judge. Eighth degree, intendant of the building. Ninth degree, master elect of the temple. Now, these names will vary a little bit from lodge to lodge, but usually the names are pretty similar to this. But notice a word that keeps coming up over and again, master, master, master. The Bible says, be not ye called master. For one is your master, which is Christ, and all ye are brethren. The Bible says not to be called father or master or rabbi. These are titles that are reserved for the Lord. We should not use these to confer upon people as honors. Okay, let me give you a little details on the ninth degree, Master Elect of the Temple. This is from their website. This degree reminds us that through the ages, man has searched for God in many ways and worshipped him in many tongues, but that universal worship is found in service to our fellow man. So it's ecumenical by nature. It gets worse. Tenth degree, Mason, Master Elect of 15. Eleventh degree, Sublime Master Elected. 12th degree, Grand Master Architect. 13th degree, Master of the Ninth Arch. I mean, are these just grown-up boys who like Dungeons and Dragons or something? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what in the world? 
Did these guys play too much, uh, you know, role-playing card games as a kid or something? I mean, master of the ninth arch, 14th degree grand elect mason, 15th degree knight of the east or sword, 16th degree prince of Jerusalem, 17th degree knight of the east and west, 18th degree knight of the rose, some French thing that I can't pronounce. Somebody help me out. C-R-O-I-X? Croy? Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know French. Knight of the Rose Croy of HRDM. But listen to this one. 19th degree, if you get into Freemasonry, when you get to the 19th degree, you will become Grand Pontiff. You know what Pontiff means? Priest. Grand Priest. Grand Pontiff. Listen to what this degree teaches. This degree proclaims the spiritual unity of all who believe in God and cherish the hope of immortality, no matter what religious leader they follow or what creed they profess. It's concerned pri primarily with the perennial conflict between light and darkness, good and evil, God and Savior. Did you hear that? The spiritual unity of all who believe in God, no matter what religious leader they follow, meaning that you could follow Buddha, you could follow Jesus, you could follow Muhammad, as long as you just believe in God. Let me tell you something. There is none other name under heaven Amen. given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says, whosoever denieth the Son, meaning Jesus, the Son of God, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If you're worshiping a God, and you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as a false God. Because no man cometh by the, unto the Father but by Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, you don't have the Father. You have another Father. You have another false God. And so this teaching is an ecumenical, new world order, one world government, one world religion. Let's all join together the spiritual unity of all religions. It's wicked. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. 20th degree, master ad vitam. 21st degree, patriarch Noachite. 22nd degree, prince of Libanus. 23rd degree, chief of the tabernacle. 24th degree, brother of the forest. Brother of the forest. This degree teaches us that a mutual belief in a supreme power should bind all men together in a worldwide brotherhood. Now listen to me. I don't believe in a supreme power. I believe in Jesus. Amen. Not a supreme power. The supreme power. Jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Right. And there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus that brings salvation. And without that name... You're not even in the ballpark. But he said the universal brotherhood of all men. No, the Bible teaches that our brothers and sisters are those who believe in Christ. Because the Bible says that you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you don't believe in the name of Jesus, you're not a child of God. You become a child of God by believing in Jesus. And so we are not brothers and sisters with all human beings who just believe in a supreme being. That's false. Because you know who considers himself a supreme power is the devil. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And he considers himself to be the God of this world. 25th degree, master of achievement. 26th degree, prince of mercy. 27th degree, knight of Jerusalem. 28th degree, Knight of the Sun, S-U-N, of course. 29th degree, Knight of St. Andrew. Now, all of these degrees, they keep coming back to the principle of uniting all religions. And remember, this is from their own website, Advertising Freemasonry. This is what you're going to learn if you join. They can't go into all the secret and occultic rituals because it's all secretive. But this is just a little sentence about each level just to kind of whet your appetite. Okay, here's what it says about the 29th degree, the Knight of St. Andrew. This degree emphasizes the Masonic teachings of equality and toleration. We are reminded that no one man, no one church, no one religion has a monopoly of truth. 
that while we must be true and faithful to our own conviction, we must respect the opinions of others. That's not what the Bible says. You see, in the Bible, Abel was the one who had faith in the Lord, according to Hebrews chapter 11. Remember the two brothers, Cain and Abel? Adam and Eve, they had those two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel, by faith, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He actually brought of the lamb. He brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. He did an animal sacrifice of a lamb, which pictured Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Cain, on the other hand, he brought of the fruits of the earth. He brought fruits and vegetables and said, well, this is my labor. This is my work. This is what I've achieved. I'm going to offer this to the Lord. Basically, that symbolizes he was trusting in his own works and in his own deeds, whereas Abel's trusting in Jesus. He's trusting in the Lamb of God. Well, do you know what the Bible says about Cain's offering? It says, God did not have respect unto Cain and his offering. He respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And this made Cain angry, and Cain ended up murdering his brother Abel because his own works were evil and his brother's We're righteous. So what the Bible is showing us is that we're not supposed to respect all religions. The Bible says we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let me ask this. Did Elijah respect the prophets of Baal? Did Jeremiah respect the false gods that the children of Judah were worshiping at that time? Did Jesus respect the Pharisees' religion or the Sadducees' religion or other false religions of the period? No, they spoke against those. They said there's only one God. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And yes, there is a man who has a monopoly on truth and his name's Jesus. Amen. He has the monopoly on truth. There is a book that has a monopoly on truth. It's the Bible. Amen. There is a religion that has a monopoly on truth. It's called Christianity. But masonry teaches that no man, no church, no religion has a monopoly on truth because they believe that you can be a Hindu, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian, you can believe in whatever supreme being you want. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's the message of the New World Order. That's the message of ecumenicalism. 30th degree grand inspector. I don't know, it's like inspector gadget or what? 31st degree knight aspirant. 32nd degree, sublime prince of the royal secret. 33rd degree, sovereign grand inspector general. So let's just talk about just the first degree, shall we? Okay, we've seen the, the end game here is to teach you to worship not Jesus, not the God of the Bible, but just the supreme being. It's a God that they have invented. It's the God of Freemasonry, who's not the God of the Bible, because he's not associated with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So the God of Freemasonry, they call him God, of, or I'm sorry, the great, they call him the great, it's slipping my mind, great architect of the, yeah, here we go, great architect of the universe, right? Great architect of, yeah, because they say, it's sometimes like an acronym, like GAUTU, kind of a weird acronym, but, The great architect of the universe is who they worship. Not Jesus, not the Lord, not a biblical God, but just this God that they made up. So let's just talk about just the first degree alone is bad enough. Because you say, well, I know some Freemasons and they didn't get to the brother of the forest yet. And they didn't get to the grand pontiff level yet. So they didn't really get into those depths of Satan. And they just don't really know. Okay, let's just talk about the first degree. Because even the first degree right away shows you that this is not biblical Christianity. First of all, masonry has its own Ten Commandments, which is a law to its initiates. These are its Ten Commandments. This is taken from chapter one of Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, one of the founders of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the United States. Albert Pike, long-haired sodomite that he was. But anyway, he was a sodomite, by the way. But... Here's his Ten Commandments that the initiates to Freemasonry learn, even in their first degree. Number one, God is the eternal, omnipotent, immutable wisdom and supreme intelligence and exhaustless love. So their first commandment is that God is basically this supreme intelligence or wisdom. Okay, 
But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods That's right. before me. Whereas Freemasonry teaches you can worship any god. You could be a Hindu, you could be a, a Muslim, you could be Christian, you could be whatever the religion, and you're accepted into the ranks of Freemasonry because God's just a supreme intelligence. But the Bible has that a little different. No other gods before me. Okay. Now, here's the thing about that is that it's blasphemous just to come up with your own Ten Commandments in the first place because here's what you're saying. There's something wrong with God's Ten Commandments. I'm going to revise them. I'm going to do better. Now, that's blasphemous right there. And this goes to show you how Freemasonry is a substitute for Christianity. Mm -hmm. You see, we are supposed to get our fellowship and camaraderie and brotherhood at a local church. We go to a local church. We have our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We get Bible teaching. We have camaraderie. We have fellowship. Why would I need to go to this other organization that's not a church worshiping Jesus? Why would I need to go to this other organization to, to have this fellowship and camaraderie with a bunch of people who aren't even saved, don't even claim to believe in Jesus, and then I'm going to sit there and replace God's Ten Commandments with their fake Ten Commandments? And so, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go through all of their Ten Commandments, but let me tell you one of the commandments that's missing. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor is missing. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Of course, m many of the Ten Commandments are missing, and they've been replaced. Commandments against idolatry, commandments not to have any other God before him, not to take his name in vain. But one of the ones that's conspicuously missing is uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And this is because Freemasons are taught that if they go to court, they're not to testify against a fellow Freemason. And so, therefore, even if it means committing perjury, that is a lesser evil than for them to harm their fellow Freemason. So one time my dad, because my dad had an electrical business and he had a dispute with somebody and all the evidence was on his side. So he took this guy to small claims court because he had done electrical work for the guy and the guy never paid the bill. So my dad took this guy to small claims court and he goes to court and the judge is Judge Wapner. Okay. Now this is before Judge Wapner had a TV show. Okay. But my dad being from Los Angeles, California, it was a smaller place back then. Judge Wapner, this is before he had his own TV show. Okay, who knows who I'm talking about, Judge Wapner. Yeah, all right. Well, Judge Wapner is presiding, and my dad goes to court, and he's going against this, this guy trying to get paid in small claims court, and the guy throws up this Masonic symbol, and I don't really know how to do it. I don't care to know how to do it. I don't really need to know all the depths of Satan to preach against it. But it's some kind of a thing where you put your hands up like a field goal and then they flap them around or they, you do three, three times flapping or whatever, this field goal symbol. And it, and, it, and it means, is there no mercy for the widow's son? You know, it's just this weird occultic symbol that they have. They're supposed to flash this symbol or if they're in a place where flashing the symbol would be too weird, they're supposed to just say that code word, you know, is there no compassion for the widow's son or whatever. So this guy, he flashes that symbol and then Wapner rules for that guy, even though all the evidence was against that guy because he had flashed that sign. Because in Freemasonry, if they flash that sign, you have to do it. And the rules are, you're only supposed to flash that sign when you're really desperate. But if you flash it, you have to, you know, do what they're asking you to do. You have to give them help or succor if they do that. So that was just kind of a first-hand experience that my dad had with this many, many. But another thing about the first degree of Freemasonry is that right from the get-go, it requires you to swear an oath to a false god right away. Now look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. The Bible says, Again, you've heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all. Now, that right there should show any Freemason or any Christian that they can't become a Freemason. Because in order for a Christian to become a Freemason, they have to violate the Word of God by swearing an oath to become a Freemason. Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, 
for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. He's saying just say yes or no, but don't swear. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. The word of there is talking about the source of it. It's coming from, it's coming of or out of evil. That's where it comes from. These type of dark oaths and swearing. And they swear that all these horrible things will happen to them if they betray their fellow Masons or if they reveal the secrets or whatever, you know, that they're going to be stabbed in the eye with a three-pronged sword. It's all these gross things about being disemboweled and, you know, at different levels. They make all these oaths. But look, any oath, even if you're swearing by the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus said, no, don't do it. Swear not at all. James said in chapter 5, verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So right there, the Bible is saying we shouldn't make these oaths and swear, especially not when we're swearing to the great architect of the universe that's dissociated from Jesus. Go, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And by the way, even in their own writings, for example, Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, and you can read this in a lot of places from the mouths of the Freemasons themselves, they claim to be a continuation of the ancient mystery religions. That's what they'll say. You know, we're continuing the ancient mystery religions. That's where that eye symbol comes from. The Egyptian god Horus It's called the, the eye of Horus. And that's why on the dollar bill, you have that pyramid with that eye in it. Okay. What in the world is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of American money? I mean, was our country founded by Egypt? Think about it. I mean, we came out of Great Britain. We have immigrants from a lot of different countries all over the world. But what in the world connection is there between the United States of America and Egypt? There's no good. What, what is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of the dollar bill with that all-seeing eye of Horus? I'll tell you why. Because that symbol was designed by Freemasons. In fact, even the American flag was designed by Freemasons. That's why it has the blue field with the stars on it. Because they have this pagan occult teaching where that if you go down into a well in the daytime, supposedly that if you go to the bottom of a well and look straight up into the sky, you can see the stars in the daytime. I don't think that's really true. I think that's been debunked, but I'm not 100% sure. But this was an ancient belief of pagans. So they would build these temples where they could look up at the stars, you know, like Stonehenge, where they have the open ceiling to the stars. But then a lot of their indoor occult temples will have a ceiling. And, uh, you know, Dr. Roland Rasnett, he traveled all over the world and, and he visited a lot of these temples and, and, and ruins and, and different uh, monuments in, in England and elsewhere. And he said a common theme that he saw over and over again was a blue ceiling with yellow stars. Blue ceiling, yellow stars. Blue ceiling, yellow stars. Because it symbolized the blue sky and seeing the stars in the daytime in these occult rituals of, you know, worshiping the heavens and worshiping the universe and the stars and, and all these different things. So, you know, the Statue of Liberty itself, and they brag about this on Freemasonry websites, how the Statue of Liberty was designed by a Freemason. And by the way, the Statue of Liberty is a giant graven image. It's an idol. It's a false god, Prometheus, the light bearer, which, by the way, Lucifer means light bearer. And it's this kind of, uh, it, it's a, the, the god is male that it's based on. The statue is based on a male god, Prometheus. And you can see the old statue of Prometheus holding up the torch and everything like that. But then they put a dress on it and make this sort of androgynous statue of liberty, Lady Liberty. It's idolatry. It's a molten image. Look, if you don't believe me about this stuff, you say, oh, you, you lost me now, Pastor Anderson, because I'm going to go have some apple pie after the service and, and find a church that pledges allegiance every morning. But actually... <laughs> All you have to do, don't take my word for it, go to Google Maps. Did you hear me? Google Maps. Or go to Google Earth where you can look at satellite images and just look at a satellite image or a map of Washington, D.C. And you know what you're going to find? The main streets of Washington, D.C. 
form an upside down star or goat head of Baphomet. And by the way, when you go to masonry lodges, what's one of their biggest symbols? An upside down star. The same star upside down that you'll see on heavy metal albums. You know, that you'd see by bands that would have, you know, albums like, with titles like We Sold Our Soul for Rock and Roll or Worshiping Satan or whatever. And they'll have these upside down star symbols. Satanists will use that. Wiccans will use that. Gothic, you know, people who cut themselves are going to have those type of emblems on their, on their backpack and so forth. And if you just look at the streets, and you know, I don't just believe everything I hear, folks. I fact check everything. When somebody told me that about the streets, I went on Google Maps and I pulled it up and I was like, whoa. It was right there. I mean, this upside down star. It's a goat head symbol with the horns and the beard and the chin, and it represents Satan himself. Very demonic. It's all over Freemasonry. It's all over their buildings. It's all over Washington, D.C. You'll see it everywhere. That mystery Babylon religion, the mystery Egypt religion. What in the world is that symbolism doing on our money? It's because it was slipped in there, it was smuggled in there by... Freemasons who are an occultic, dark, secret society worshiping the devil himself, okay? And this stuff is not hard to, to fact check. Second uh, Corinthians 6, did I have you turn there? Yeah. The Bible says in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Balliol? And Balliol is the devil. Baal, Bel, Balliol, Beelzebub. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Who would an infidel be? Jews, Muslims, Hindus, you know, apostate Christians. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. See, the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you know what? Sure, that's talking about the fact that we shouldn't marry somebody who's not saved. And by the way, you young people, don't ever date somebody who's not saved. Amen. Don't be unequally yoked. But that's not only talking about marriage. When you join the Masonic Lodge, you're unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yeah. You are joining in fellowship and fraternity. That's what they call it, fraternity, brotherhood, with those who not only deny Christ, not only don't believe in Christ, but they actually have satanic symbols and worship the devil. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When you get to the third level... Because the rubber really meets the road in Freemasonry levels 4 through 32, okay? The first three levels are sort of the beginner levels, sort of get you in the door levels. And then levels 4 through 32 is where the rubber kind of meets the road. And then to become a 33rd degree Mason, you have to just be a 32nd degree Mason who gets voted into that honor, you know, as being an outstanding 32nd degree. You hit that highest pinnacle of the pyramid, of, of uh, worshiping Satan. But basically, when you get to the third degree, this is where it gets more intense. They go through a ceremony where you're inducted in, where they literally hold a knife over you and they mock like they're killing you with the knife. And then you die and then you're brought back to life and everything. And they use wording of you're redeemed from your sins. They use wording like it's salvation that you're achieving here. By, by going through the process of masonry, you're receiving redemption. And they believe they're going to go to that great lodge in the sky, my friend. They teach salvation and redemption in Freemasonry through works. Through works. It's a, it's a labor thing. Mason, what, what does the word mason even mean? It's somebody who makes things with bricks and stone. Just like electrician, carpenter, mason. Freemasonry is based on working your way to heaven through following the morality and the teachings and the works of Freemasonry. And so they offer salvation 
and they do a mockery of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by going through this, this fake ritual, not giving Jesus the credit, not giving Jesus the glory for anything, but a substitute for church is what Freemasonry is. It's a substitute God, a substitute salvation, a substitute religion for people to feel religious and good about themselves and part of the club. It's a wicked club. It's false. It's evil. Oh, they do so much good in the community. Nonsense. The devil himself is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers are transformed into the ministers of light. And you see them with their, with their funny hats on the billboard. Oh, we did that. We helped these people. They're trying to hide behind their works that they do openly to be seen of men, just like the Pharisees where they'd give money and sound a trumpet so everybody knows that they gave. They do that openly as a smokescreen for their dar darkness and works of evil. Pharisees did the same thing. Sadducees, did, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And so it, it, it's clearly, and, and look, we're not even barely scratching the surface in this sermon. This is like a really basic sermon. This is just a 101 of, of Freemasonry. I mean, if the deeper you go into it, it's that they're just openly worshiping demons and devils and they're teaching you about the ancient mystery religion of Egypt and this God and that God and this goddess and that goddess and, and they're teaching you the esoteric teachings that come from Hinduism and all that, you know, the, the self-realization and self this and self-awareness, all this different stuff. It gets so much more satanic. Listen to me, there is no way, if you even just barely look at this stuff, there is no way a Bible-believing Christian could be a Freemason. That de I guarantee you that deacon that's walking around that fundamental Baptist church with the all-seeing eye belt buckle that says he's a Freemason, that guy is going to split hell wide open, I promise yeah. you. Because there's no way a Bible-believing Christian could go to Freemasonry and go through these levels and not realize that they're worshiping the devil. Why? Because those who are saved have the Holy Spirit living inside them who will guide us into all truth. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Amen. They will not follow another. A stranger will they flee from for they know not the voice of strangers. And Jesus said, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. How can a person who has the Holy Spirit inside them walk into a temple, mock the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, swear an oath to a false god, worship along, worship God and open every meeting with prayer and close every meeting in prayer, but not in Jesus' name? Praying to some God of the universe, supreme being, with Muslims and Hindus and Jews and everybody else, and just saying, oh, it doesn't matter. They literally believe that you can worship anything as God. You can say this tree is God. And, and they, they'll say, welcome to masonry. You're our brother. I don't believe that anybody who is. And if, if, if someone is actually saved and, and joins Freemasonry, then they're an imbecile. To not see how demonic it is. You know, but I believe that that deacon is just one example of Freemasons who are devilish persons infiltrating Bible-believing churches to bring in corruption. They love to get on that deacon board. Why? So that they could steer the church in a wicked direction. Because there are certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men. There were false prophets among the people in the Old Testament. There shall be false prophets amongst you. And they privily creep in, not sparing the flock. They are wolves in sheep's clothing and they creep into churches. Uh, Dr. Roland Rasmussen, he preached about this in the 60s. He had a bunch of guys in his church that were Freemasons back in the 60s. And this is before the internet. So people didn't really realize how wicked Freemasonry was. Uh, I mean, obviously the people that are in it realize it because they're going through even the first, even the first degree is, is of the devil. Yeah. But people outside of Freemasonry didn't really know how bad it was back then. So there were guys in the church who were trying to become deacons and he had to have a major fight in his church back in the 60s fighting against the, 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 the Freemasons and, you know, blocking these guys from becoming deacons because they want to get in that position where they can exercise control in the church. Because our church is not a deacon run church. We, we believe in a pastoral led model. But a lot of Baptist churches are run by a board of deacons. Yeah. And in many cases, a board of demons, yeah. you yeah. know, when they're Freemasons in there. <laughs> and so it's of the devil. 
But let me go a step further. Let me say this. If it's ever found out that there is a member of Faithful Word Baptist Church that joins the Freemason Lodge, they will be thrown out of this church immediately. Why? Here's the scriptural authority. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners, watch this, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The Bible says that a person who calls themselves a brother that's a fornicator is a wicked person. Put them out of the church. And the Bible says the same for drunkards and others. But one of the things on the list is idolater. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you know what? A person who worships another god is an idolater. A person who goes to a pagan temple called a masonry lodge, a pagan shrine with upside down stars and goat heads and symbolism of the occult all around it, worships the great architect of the universe and mocks the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and worships a pagan idolatry mystery Babylon cult, that's an idolater by any definition. Yeah. They have another God that they're worshiping. I mean, just as much as if one of our church members went and joined the Mormon church, we'd, we'd, we'd have to cast them out of fellowship. You know, if they, if, if they joined the Roman Catholic church and started bowing down to statues and idols, they'd be cast out of the church. Why? Because we're not supposed to have company with people who are called a brother and worshiping other gods. He says, idolaters. That's what he's saying. People who are worshiping devils, worshiping false gods. Any person, and, and look, if, you, if you've ever been involved in Freemasonry in the past and you're here this morning, you just need to repent this morning and say, well, I'm never going to have anything to do with it again. I'm never going to touch it with a 10 foot pole. And you need to turn around and expose it. And you need to turn around and renounce it and reject it or else you can hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. Because if you don't renounce Freemasonry, we're going to renounce you. Because Why? Because the temple of God has no agreement with idols. Amen. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and eat at the table of devils. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And witchcraft, sorcery, devils, superstition, paganism, mystery Babylon has no place in a local church. There's nothing Christian about it. There's nothing godly about it. There's nothing righteous about it. It is all occultic, esoteric, uh, um, you know, pagan, new age, one worldism ecumenicalism, one world religion, new world order. You say, ah, it's a conspiracy theory. Well, is it a conspiracy when they're saying it? Is that a theory at that point? <laughs> Read it yourself. Look it up yourself. Read Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike if you can get through the nonsense of it and you'll see it's very clearly worshiping other gods. Mm -hmm. We won't tolerate it here. We don't yeah. accept it here. Good. We want nothing to do with it here. We will have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, we'd rather reprove them. Why? Because it's a shame to even speak of the things that are done of them in secret. In secret is the key word there. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for uh, the, the Bible, Lord, and, and salvation. Thank you that we don't need to, to dress up in, in costumes and put on funny hats at the Ku Klux Klan or the, or the Freemasonry Lodge or or other clubs where we call ourselves wizards and masters and dragons and apprentices and, and all these wicked things, Lord. Thank you for the local church, that which is clean, pure, and wholesome. Thank you for the light. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, and help us never to get yoked up in these fake substitutes for church, salvation, and you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.